Afternoon everyone, uh, my name is Derek and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Hoverscape and the big thing for this presentation really is how drones are changing forever the way we're going to be working. Um, really the advancements in technology and the implementation of drones has come such a, a long way in such a short period of time um, that it's definitely forever going to change. So to give you a quick background of myself, um, I have a background in photography and aviation. So I've been a commercial pilot for over 15 years, flown everything from four-seater light aircraft to 400-seat jumbo jets. Um, and we started Hoverscape back in 2013. Back then, drones were really in their infancy in Australia and they were big, uh, they were custom made, um, and it was really just the birth of drones within the industry. So fast forward four years, the technology has just come leaps and bounds and the way we're using drones has really going to be cemented now in the way we work going forward. Basically, what is a drone? I mean, we've all seen them, we've all heard about them, and I guess a lot of you have probably even flown some. Um, what we're probably most used to are the smaller type of drones on the left, um, the lightweight drones with the little cameras. But today what we're mainly talking about is more the industrial drones. And the big difference between them is not only the size and weight, but it's all the safety features. So unlike the smaller drone, industrial drones carry duplicated systems for everything. So they have redundancy features, they have see and avoid sensors. Um, they're even now carrying equipment that commercial airliners are using in terms of traffic avoidance. So one of these drones will transmit its position back to the drone pilot. So you'd be able to even see where manned aircraft are. Why we're using these drones now is for how safe they are, how reliable they are, not in terms of just the drone itself, but also with surrounding manned air traffic. So as I said, there's so many ways people are implementing drones now, and there's so many amazing things, and it's not just what you see on TV, it's not just pizza delivery, but um, some of the biggest areas where drones are affecting change right now uh, in these type of service. So I'll give you a bit of insight into how drones are working in these fields. So if we take this building, for instance, um, this is a heritage building. It's an old form of water station up in Sydney. And this building, you could imagine how much or how much time it would take to traditionally inspect it. So traditionally you would have needed cranes, scaffold, elevated work platforms. Um, you'd have to maneuver that machinery around and you'd have to get a man team to visually inspect this whole building. Then also you've got the safety implications of people working at heights um, and all the safety gear that they require, harnessing, spotters. Um, so to give you an idea, a building like this could take weeks to inspect in a two-man team. So where drones are now changing is that weeks is now hours. No one has to work at heights. A drone can pretty much visually inspect this whole building simply by flying around it. And the time it's taken is, is, is a matter of hours. So for instance, this building here uh, was an inspection. It was basically a fault inspection. There was a big water leak and the planning involved was gonna to take too long. So we sent a drone in to find where this leak was. So as you can see, this top right corner, box gutter, they discovered a fern was growing in it and all the water was spilling over straight into the building. This was found in minutes. Um, but while the drone was up there, there was broken guttering, there was broken louvres, there was some big cracking found. So it went from a fault investigation to a full report and a, basically a condition report. So some of the key benefits just in asset inspection, it's not only that it's faster and safer, but a drone only needs a very small area to take off and land. So you haven't got big mach machinery moving around the area where there's potential for further, I guess, damage to the environment around. Also, if people are walking over buildings and structures, there's inherent 
uh, risk to damaging the roof by foot traffic. Um, so there's a lot less equipment needed and a lot less disruptions. But one of the biggest things we're finding, especially for people who manage large number of assets, is that no one seems to have a very good condition report or baseline report for all of their assets. So the benefits of having a big photographic record of the entire building is over time, you can monitor the condition and deterioration of any of structural area within that building. The next biggest part of it is once you have that baseline report and you can monitor deterioration over time, is that you can better plan any rectification works based on priority. Where do you send your people, when, and how many people do you send? How much material do you need? Um, what type of access will you need? So this is the big part of better planning. And with all of these benefits by using a drone, ultimately there's a big reduction in costs. So we're inspecting a lot of type of assets these days. These are some of the most common ones. Um, and basically they're ideal for any site that's dangerous, difficult to access, um, but this is only a short range of, of, of what we're actually inspecting with drones at the moment. So there's two simple ways that a drone inspection can be done. Uh, the first one is with a team or an inspector. So the drone will feed a very high definition video link live. Um, so whoever has the inspector can have the controller and work with a drone pilot to target any specific areas. And if anything's found, powerful cameras and zoom lenders really zoom in and can get amazing detail where a full assessment can pretty much be made live. Um, another secondary method, uh, which has really been used a lot for baseline reports, is for instance, that image on the left is pretty much the water tower and every blue dot is basically an image that's been taken by the drone. So it does pre-planned flight plans, captures hundreds of images, and what we do then via software is spatially arrange that to pretty much regenerate a high definition model, 3D model. So any area of this building can be zoomed in to see mo the most minute details. That's good for um, being able to access this via cloud-based system. Every part of it can be annotated and shared instantly with colleagues, contractors. Uh, so everyone's working off the same report. And that's when planning and rectification works, even tendering for rectification um, can be used. So one of the biggest questions we get is how much detail we can actually get out of photograph. Now, if we take that image on the left, that's basically taken from Google Maps and that's as far in as you can zoom. So one pixel of that image is almost equivalent to 60 centimeters worth of ground distance. Where with a drone, you can get that to less than a centimeter, which means you're seeing minute cracks, um, minute rusting, a whole range of things. So you can see, you can see even minor, small twigs. And I mean, this is off a projector, but on a high definition screen, the amount of detail is, is unbelievable. A similar method, um, especially used in development projects, infrastructure projects, um, from the birth of them, is mapping and survey. So a typical ground survey for a large distance, something that would take a traditional team a week, can be done in as little as an hour. And with the powerful software that's available now, a drone will fly pretty much a grid pattern along and will take hundreds of photos. And then once again, it's spatially um, put together into highly detailed ortho maps. So like your near maps, like your Google maps. But out of that one set of imagery, it will then convert that into point clouds. Uh, 3D models, contour lines, um, pretty much a whole range of, of survey accurate data. So this is really beneficial, especially in the early stages of planning. So site selection, uh, the pre-development surveys, and and for a range of a range of um, survey requirements. 
So when we say survey accurate, basically with, with modern day ground control points, which are pretty much little GPS locators that are thrown here and there around the site, each one gets its own GPS position. And then that's embedded into the map to turn your 3D models, your ortho photos, um, down to accuracies of, of centimetre level internally and globally um, to five centimetres in height or two centimetres across. So out of these models, you can measure distances by two simple clicks. That will give you also cross elevations, that will give you gradients, stockpile analysis. It's all done in minutes. And that's all done within our cloud-based software that's instantly shareable, so you don't have to deal with large file types. Um, but saying that all of this is exported so it can be directly imported into your own GIS software and CAD programs. So where this is really saving as well is not just in the pre-planning phase, um, but in the reporting phase. So now with the development of BIM software where we're comparing actual data versus planned data, regular mapping runs or regular survey, because it's so quick and easy, it's getting used a lot more. Um, it's getting used a lot more to compare planned progress versus actual progress. And this is so powerful and so accurate that if foundations, for instance, are laid and they're slightly off compared to your plan, you're picking that up straight away. And that's happening a lot now where you're not leaving it to longer into the project where then you've discovered a fault with how you've actually built. It's also good, it's been used a lot for contractual arrangements to ensure that progress is on time because you get a full comprehensive data set on your whole site or your whole project, but you've got the detail to zoom in and inspect individual elements. So it's not only very capable technically, but what we're probably most known for uh, in what you're probably most familiar with is a lot of marketing material. For instance, view photography. Now, this is big, especially with the amount of construction going on across Australia. Um, a set of plans and drawings no longer have to be 3D modeled or rendered. Um, drones are actually can fly to specific GPS positions and they're accurate to within centimeters those positions and to the to exact heights or relative level heights. So if you're putting up a 30 story building and with a set of plans, you can effectively have a drone fly to office windows and capture 360 degree photos. Um, so you'll know what views you're actually gonna have, especially in residential. What are you gonna actually see from your balcony? At what height does um, a selling feature come into view? Like for instance, we've done ones recently for Crown Casino to see what light, at uh, what height the Harbour Bridge comes into view or the Opera House comes into view. So it's a, a really powerful marketing tool. And especially if you're not getting the view you're expected, because this is all done pre-construction phase, plans are then amended before construction even begins. So marketing imagery, and it's not just um, for business, but a lot of infrastructure projects now getting the message out to the public about construction phases, whether it's new rail, roads. Um, with the biggest increase we've seen is in, in video marketing. So they estimate by the end of next year, all content that goes online will be video based. And how much video is going online now? For instance, YouTube are putting 12 days worth of content onto YouTube every minute. So that's how much video. So how uh, businesses and organizations then standing out from the crowd. And one of the biggest selling features is giving a perspective that people don't often see. And that's usually by drone. Now, not only is it aerial based, but usually incorporating aerial with ground components gives a really awe inspiring and it really attracts people to not flick past and stop and watch. So one of the biggest parts of drones, and it's 
probably have the most amount of questions is built around regulation. Um, who needs to be licensed and what are the rules? So to operate for economic gain, there's pretty much two types of licensing in Australia. One's a remote pilot's operator certificate. And to give you a quick overview, that's effectively starting a mini airline. So you'll have a chief pilot, you'll have a set of uh, operating manuals, you'll have safety assessments and risk guides, you're um, flight tested by the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, and ultimately you get your remote pilot operating certificate. This allows a great flexibility when operating a drone anywhere around Australia. The only exemption to this is for the smaller drones that are less than two kilos in size. The only problem with the, the, the smaller drones means smaller cameras. Smaller cameras means you get less detail and they don't handle lighting conditions very well. So it's similar to taking a picture on your phone. But yes, you can still buy a drone as a hobbyist and fly it around. But even as a hobbyist, anyone who operates a drone needs to fly it within the regulations. So some of them are like, they're only limited to 400 feet in altitude without an approval from CASA. Um, you're not allowed to be within 30 metres of a building or a person unless approved by CASA. But the main one is airspace. So if we looked out today, you think it's a beautiful day, we'll go out, fly the drone, get some pictures of this building. But um, knowingly, we're actually within five and a half kilometres of Canberra Airport. So this is a restricted area. You can't fly a drone here. Now for a hobbyist, that even goes further because it's not just major airports like Sydney, Melbourne, Canberra, Brisbane. It's all the smaller little airports, but more so it's heliports. So you can think of every hospital around has a licensed registered heliport. So that's five and a half kilometers around that is a restricted airspace. Um, so there are good apps out there now. CASA have just put one out, can I fly there? And if we look at this, this is Melbourne all of this orange is pretty much restricted. So you can see how much of Melbourne is actually a no-fly zone. Um, so that's probably one of the biggest restrictions. So remote pilot who've gone through all the CASA certifications, they have exemptions and they're operationally allowed to fly there. So there's a lot on the CASA website about drone restrictions.